you're not going to believe it, people. We have Duncan Trussell here sitting down with us right now today. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. What's going on, my brother? Welcome to the oh, Warrior Poet Project. Thanks so much. Thanks for the tour, Aubrey. I'm kind of blown away. Yeah. Uh, had no idea that you had this sprawling complex behind you because you're such a uh, humble guy that <laughs> well, you um, you don't like the the... I don't know, man. I think my head would get really swollen if I had a massive gym slash warehouse slash uh, creativity suite. Well, you know what, Duncan? I'll tell you what helps. You know what helps what? is when ayahuasca tells you your water borrowed from the ocean that the ocean <laughs> forgot. <laughs> tells you your gum on nothing's shoe. You're not even nothing. Yeah, you're the gum you, on nothing's shoe. Uh, ayahuasca, like, oh. have you uh, <laughs> seen my indoor volleyball court? <laughs> Because I may be gum on nothing shoe, but I have an indoor volleyball court. Yeah, Ayahuasca doesn't care. That's cool. And yeah. of course it does all. I mean, yes, clearly, obviously, all things are just waves of particulates r rushing through time. I get that. But there is something very sweet about having success yeah. in your life. It's, it's, and, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Absolutely. And so it's really cool to see how it's manifested around you because it's uh, it's... You know, actually, I was just reading this really cool uh, Buddhist exercise where they, where you, I, I want to memorize it, but it's a, it's from one of those scriptures, and uh, you, you list what the body is composed of. It's mm -hmm. a, actually just a list of liver, spleen, saliva, blood, uh, feces, semen, all the things inside your body, brain. You list it. And the idea is that each of these components, when separated from the body, they are no longer attractive. Like if mm -hmm. you take the most sure. beautiful woman in the world and take her hand off of her body and you should, like had the hand laying on a table and said, this hand is from the most beautiful woman in the world. <laughs> Well, I mean, you get arrested. Like, what have you done, <laughs> you psychopath? Well, you're right, with the exception of one thing. What? The vagina. Because I used to know a company called Fleshlight. Oh, right. That pretty much made a living. Out of selling these things. Out of selling models of vaginas. But the vagina bottle, which I have penetrated and come <laughs> inside of many times, because when Joe is sponsored by them, I, uh -huh. I, fuck, I fuck the Fleshlight a few times. <laughs> have some very. It's always a sad moment when you come inside yes, of a flashlight. No uh, it's a sad moment when you, like pull this like plastic tube off your flaccid oily penis and realize that you just <laughs> fucked a, 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 pl a cylinder and so that's a sad moment is it sadder than when a little bit gets on your stomach because that's pretty sad for me when that happens. when whenever you come and it gets on your side that's never like the little slug trail <laughs> yeah. it's, it's never like bother me at all <laughs> that much at least i mean it's like i'll just wipe it off whatever but it yeah. is all kind of like in in the same weird realm of like not sadness but not really anything but fleshlights aren't people aren't buying fleshlights because of the aesthetic value that a fleshlight adds to its environment you wouldn't go to your like a house that you were trying to spruce up and leave a fleshlight on the no. table that's in fact going to just a giant us. statue of my cock yeah is what i would is what i would prefer there you go <laughs> Yeah, maybe that would work. <laughs> maybe that would work, but still it would kind of create, you know, the, the it, vibe would shift <laughs> and it, maybe in, in a direction. A little bit. You might yeah. not want it to go to. If I had sticks of butter that so they could butter the family lingam, you know, that was an old tradition, right? Hey, yeah. Buttering well, the family lingam. Come on in, man. Look, you mind taking your shoes off? Yeah, that's a sculpture of my cock. Would you <laughs> mind putting some butter on it? It's part of the tradition. People visit my house. Uh -huh. But the, the, the idea is that it's the... Um, what makes a, a human body beautiful is the way that the congruence of all these separate parts that come together to create an individual and that those that's where the beauty comes from. If you remove anything from that, it's no longer beautiful. It's just something that is whatever it is. Not to mm -hmm. say that a, a, a severed hand, you couldn't look at that and it, it, like, appreciate it, appreciate in, some it yeah. in some weird way. But obviously, you would much rather the hand be attached to the beautiful person for sure for a lot of different reasons so when you when i see a place like this then you see all these awesome components sort of blending together to create that gestalt or this like really good vibe mm -hmm. which you are there is a reflection of the vibe you're the vibe you put out 
and you just see like, oh, how fucking cool. Like this thing kind of grew up around yeah. this stuff that you're putting out. Well, it's out now mutually it. supportive too because this has enough momentum that if I start to stray off course, this can bring me back. Yeah. And if this starts to stray off course, you know, I can bring it back and other people who are here can bring yeah. it back. So it's this positive momentum loop, you know. Super cool. Yeah, it's awesome. And when people come here, that's the thing too is – it makes a, a different impression. They understand the company and what we're about in a different way. Because it's, it's inspiring. It's soaked into the walls here. You yeah. Know? You yeah, it really is. feel it. Yeah. Well, I named this podcast The Genesis of Duncan Trussell because I want to go into this. And I want to start, you know, most Genesis starts, oh, you know, I grew up. No, 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 not for you, Duncan. Mm-hmm. I have another idea. We're starting pre-birth. Pre-birth. I want you to hypothesize. Obviously, it's beyond the realm of knowledge. But hypothesize what's going on pre-birth. When you, do you make a decision to enter this baby form with your family? Or is it, you know, kind of wheeled in in some cosmic clock? Because I know both of us believe in reincarnation. Yeah. So what's happening pre-birth before you decide to enter this incarnation? Well, yeah, that's a great question. I, and I love the, you know, somebody, God damn it, who is saying this? I guess I read it somewhere. I need to start keeping better notes. I've started taking pictures of, like, quotes that I like mm-hmm. in my phone because, so that I can, like, refer to them again. But... I'm going to lie to Mapacho in the meantime. Mapacho is sacred tobacco. It comes from Peru. I'm taking a very special treat and smoking it on the podcast with Duncan Trussell. <laughs> Not many guests get the sacred Mapacho smoke during. It smells good. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the, these, uh, I can't remember who it was. It was someone who was a Buddhist and their kids weren't into Buddhism and they brought their kids to meet this Buddhist lama, like this very high teacher, and they asked him to tell them something that they could understand without understanding Buddhism at all. And he said to them, now I'm going to paraphrase here, but the only thing that remains when you die is the state of consciousness, is your state of consciousness as you expire. It's the, your state of consciousness is what is the momentum that pushes you Mm -hmm. into whatever your next incarnation is going to be or whatever the next place the particular energy that you would call your soul what how that is going to manifest in in the next place or the moment after death or the way the the wave keeps rolling is where your energy energetic or state is when you die so if you're in a state of fear, anger, or freaking out, then that's the wave that rolls into the future. And if you're in a state of calm, letting go, mm. equanimity, and peacefulness, then that's the kind of vibe that's going to go rolling into the future. And which is why uh, meditation is often often called the preparation for death. So that when death comes, which it will come for all of us, uh, and all the things that go along with death, are happening which is you won't be able to breathe as well your your body is more than likely going to be in a lot of pain uh you're going to be experiencing a lot of emotional energy which is going to be good and bad and all these things are going to happen at the same time and it's going to be a very very uh you know how they say there's a I think it's the Horn of Africa sailing around the Horn of Africa is a very dangerous thing to do because it's always turbulent there mm-hmm. but uh, it used to be you would have to make that journey, and so you'd have to be a master sailor to get around there. Now, listen, you guys, don't fact check anything I just said, because <laughs> I don't know for sure. I just saw this documentary on this girl who sailed, her, sailed around the world. I think and she both went of to, the capes, Cape Horn, Cape, uh, yeah. Horn of Africa. Yeah. That's death. So in our journey that we're, of life, as we sail through the waters of time, we know that there is this cape that we're going to have to steer our ship around, and that's the cape of death. And we don't know what's around the other side, but we do know that the, probably the very same principles that apply to sailing in rough waters are going to apply to that moment when we move out of our identification with this body. And so that means if we can keep a clear head, mm-hmm. if we can stay calm, and if we have had practice in navigating through these waters, then when this moment happens, we're going to be able to, it'll be a piece of cake. Well, that's what, you know, doing these medicine journeys has done for me is because it really pushes you past that point, particularly ayahuasca. I mean, you feel like you're past the point of your death. You Mm -hmm. accept it, you move on, and you're in that place. It looks like your death. And doing something also like Vilca, which was the snorted DMT, 5-MeO DMT, NN DMT, and Bufotenine, 
Oh. And it, you snort it, both nostrils full of this ancient powder that the Shavin people used to do. And it takes you to the point where your body's gone. I mean, you feel like you're in that realm. And it's so peaceful there and so beautiful that mm -hmm. it eradicates the fear once you accept that you're gone. And that I think that practice is something that is incredibly valuable because we all carry this burden of fear of what that might be. Yes. And either through meditation or through whatever practice you can get to, Earth. to go through that is amazing. Did you know that Aldous Huxley, the great author, he took LSD on his deathbed? Yeah, his, he wrote to his wife yeah. a, a prescription. He wrote it, and it, I've seen an image of it. I don't know if it's the real thing, but he wrote whatever a doctor would write for yeah. inje an injection of LSD when he died. And I understand that because he was probably experiencing some fear and if you take a high enough dose of a psychedelic, it'll push you into that state. Mm -hmm. And what I'm really interested in right now is getting to that state minus the psychedelic. And is it possible? I think it is. And how how do we do that? I, I had a podcast with uh, the Kirtan singer Krishna Das. Have you ever heard of him? Mm -hmm. Oh, he's great. But he go he's like he sings Kirtans, which are uh, they call it the chanting of the names, and it's like these the, the Hari Krishna would be one Hari right. Krishna Hari Krishna 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 Hari 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 Ram Hari Ram 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 Hari Hari. That's one. There's a lot of different ones, uh, but they all are rep. They all are sort of the sound vibration of a universal principle, so to speak. And so by chanting them, you are tuning your consciousness like a guitar tuning your string. Frequency, You're yeah. tuning your frequency to that, and so he that's his practice and um he's a child of the 60s as a lot of the people in the satsang that i like to hang out with the ram das camp and they have all done massive amounts of psychedelics and uh he so they were very familiar with the benefits that come from it and they're very vocal about the fact that if not for the psychedelics they never would have gotten to a place where they were yeah it's almost like I, I describe it to people you know, you can meditate, but unless you know where you're going, it's like you're wandering aimlessly in the woods and you don't know when you've arrived and you don't know what you're looking mm. for, you know. But psychedelics can show you where you're going so that all of these other tools can help you get back. That's right. I think it's a wonder. They're, they both, you, they, all is permissible if your intention is to wake up because yeah. if you can wake up and, and you can reduce your own suffering and fear or transform your suffering and fear, then what's going to happen is the ripples that you're sending out in every moment are going to reduce the fear of people around you. Mm -hmm. And that's benef beneficial to the planet. And the planet, like any other organism, wants to be healthy. And so it's going to back you up in that pursuit. Yeah, That's for sure. And so any way that you, as long as the intention behind it is, I want to ease the suffering of people on this planet, as long as that's the intention behind it, and you're one of the people on the planet, so start with yourself. I want to ease my own suffering. Then you're going to find a lot of allies spring up out of the blue that are very happy about the fact that you've gotten to this place, almost as though your entire life was to reach that place. And all these people just come out of the woodwork like your tutors or your mm -hmm. teachers that have been assigned to you by some very loving, super intelligent force that is really excited about you uh, waking up. It's really cool. And psychedelics are one way to get there. I'm really into Buddhism right now, man. It's so badass. I'm getting yeah. deeper and deeper and yeah. deeper into it because it is, for me, my experience with psychedelics has always been blast off in the, in the highest places I've ever been on, like on LSD in particular, MEO DMT, mm -hmm. also uh, DMT, DMT, uh, <laughs> What happens for me is I'm shown a thing and a thing talks to me and I get the very same feeling that I had when I was a little kid and would wander into a, uh, a party my parents were having. Like you, they put you to bed, but then they have a party and you yeah, come downstairs yeah, yeah. and everybody's excited to see you, but they also know you're not supposed to be there. Yeah. <laughs> for a second, they're like, ah, look at you, oh. And they say things and they're doing things and there's all this stuff going on there that it, you recognize as being really cool and beautiful, but maybe you, you can't translate it so well. Mm -hmm. So for me, when I start reading uh, some of the Buddhist uh, literature I'm reading, this book Mindfulness by Joseph Goldstein, um, and some books by Pema Chodron, and I see uh, a really 
beautiful analysis of those states of consciousness, a really beautiful framework to look at it through so that I can carry those moments into my everyday life. Uh, it's really exciting to me. And it's, it's exciting to me too, because and that's one of the things that I enjoy talking to you so much about is because we've both been on these parallel paths, mine being firsthand experience where I'm yeah. learning these things from the from the ether, from the other, from the source, yes. if you will, and trying to translate them and figure them out. And you're like, oh yeah, that's what's been in a book for 2,000 years yeah. if you'd have bothered to read it. Yeah. But I couldn't just read it for me the way my personality is. I had to go find it for myself. And then, but drawing those parallels back to tradition is beautiful. And I love hearing that. And that's one of the reasons I love talking to you so much about it is because I can tell you one of my experiences and you say, oh yeah, that reminds me of this concept and it, that's elucidated you know, to stand the tests of time in that beautiful way that Buddhism can do. And your experience of ayahuasca, I keep reading things, the last experience that we've talked about, the entering into that complete nullification or void, I, I was just reading about that and how, um, there, so you know, Buddhism is sort of the, the basis of the thing is that in every single moment most people are experiencing either attraction or aversion that's what people are experiencing they're experiencing a de wanting to be somewhere else because they are longing for the pleasure of that place or wanting to be somewhere else because they don't like the pain that they have mm -hmm. are experiencing in the place that they currently are some so, kind of push or pull or both or both so generally you'll find yourself being in a one, one great moment. Another thing I like about Buddhism is all the moments that you formerly thought were awful or, or times when terrible things are happening to you in Buddhism, they're like, no, this is the, these are the moments for you to like work. These are like every time you find, the next time you find yourself in a state of boredom yeah, and you're just bored which is like the horror of all children. I'm bored, I'm <laughs> bored, I don't like it here, boredom. So boredom equals, in Buddhism, boredom equals aversion. It's aversion. You are feeling bored because you don't want to be where you're at at that very moment. You want to get out of there. A classic example is shopping with your girlfriend, right? Is there ever a moment where you feel deeper levels of boredom and aversion <laughs> than when you find yourself in a purse store and you realize you're going to probably be there for 45 minutes to an hour and you've got to like, there's nothing for you there. Nothing for you there. there you're not buying purses. Let's imagine that you're actually... What about an elaborate game of sexual bribing? What do you mean? That's generally what I do in shopping situations. Right. Like, uh-huh. You want that? Yeah. Well, right. let's see. Open up your yeah. open up your repertoire of gifts to bring to me later. Yeah. So now you're trying to move from that moment of, <laughs> right. of pain exactly. into pleasure. So a great place to practice <laughs> is if you go shopping with your girlfriend. It's a great place to practice Buddhism because you will begin to experience the desire to speed into the future to get out of the place that you're at. Uh -huh. So that... The interesting thing in Buddhism is that what it's saying is, here's the deal. You are formlessness, ultimately. Everything that you are is in a constant and endless state of change. Now, for in the, in, in, uh, we know this in the uh, big scale of things because we can look at our parents. And then we can look at a picture of them when they were a child and we see... The person I'm looking at now is old and wrinkly, and the person I looked at as a child is very healthy. So we see there's that big scale change happening. But in the little, minute, uh, momentary way, we're constantly moving. We're in a state of going from point A to point B. We get up to use the bathroom. We look around. And so our visual field is in a constant state of flux. Our visual field is constantly changing. So we are in a constant state of change, which means that we have no permanent self. And the idea that there is a permanent self is one of the primary delusions that Buddhism has identified and also one of the primary causes of most of if not all of a human suffering is their attachment to the delusion that they are a permanent self and that all result in activity to try to escape from the ultimate truth, which is that we are nothingness, is a movement that is, uh, could be compared to somebody on fire trying to put out the fire. Mm -hmm. Only in this case, the fire is the realization that we are nothingness and 
the movement to put out the fire is everything we do to create an identity or to hold ourselves as a being. And so it's funny because you realize almost everything you've done in your life is essentially a long running temper tantrum where you have just been doing anything you can to avoid being still because if you stay still for even the shortest amount of time very quickly the thing that you think you are starts merging into the everythingness that you actually are and for whatever reason that's not a very palatable state uh for an ego to mm -hmm. be in and so that's really cool man that and i always go back to your this the gum on the shoe of uh, what is the term I was water. I was two things. I was not only nothing. I was the gum on nothing's shoe, or I was water borrowed from the ocean that the ocean forgot. That and yeah. that was that <laughs> that that feeling. It seemed like it was not a comfortable feeling. No. Me. Yeah. So. <laughs> right. No. Right. Definitely not. I wanted to be special. I wanted to be mm -hmm. something unique. My special self. This yeah. thing that kind of came out to have this great purpose, and mm -hmm. and and it was. And it was illustratively taking that from me and saying, no, you know, on another perspective, you're nothing. Like, we're all nothing. We're all part of this ocean. And the distinction of this is myself versus the collective is something that we create ourselves. That's right. But then, you know, it does, it gives you that place. And I think it's important to get there. But I really like the Toltec belief that once you achieve that, you can go act through your controlled folly is what they call it. And the controlled folly is understanding that, but still acting in a normal way, still engaging in life yes. as if, you know, as if everything that you previously thought was true, but keeping that deeper truth and then acting however you want. So yeah, if you want to, you know, eat cheeseburgers and go do whatever this earthly thing that you like, you know, makes sense to you, you can do that. And it's just your controlled folly. Like at some level, you know it's folly. It's not real. But at another level, you know, you can enjoy the shit out of it freely. Enjoy the dream. Enjoy the dream. Because the, 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 when you, you know, like there's so many times where I've been in the midst of a, you know what? It just happened. <laughs> it just happened today. I had the strangest dream. I had this dream that I had a little girl that, but I was a bad father. I had like a six-year-old girl. I was a bad father because I hadn't been spending, I like I was in a, it was really weird. Like I was in a divorce, hadn't been taking care of this kid. The mother was really tired and I was, was aware of the fact that I'd been this sort of disregarding this child. And there was a lot of guilt inside of me. And weirdly, I'm sorry to tell a dream, they're ultimately boring. But weirdly, like Jesus was in the dream, the like stereotypical, mm -hmm. like black light pic poster Jesus. And he's like watching the whole thing, but he thinks it's funny. The whole thing, he's like smiling and watching this thing happen to me. But anyway, I, I wake up from this awful nightmare where I'm a t bad dad and uh, this, the ensuing relief that c c comes in it from a dream like that. We're like, oh, thank God. Yeah, I do yeah, not. Yeah. I'm not in that life. Oh, thank God. Oh, thank God. I'm free from that life. Well, see, that can happen in this life mm -hmm. where whatever it is that you uh, consider to be the great thorn in the side of your existence, whatever your karma, karmic loop is, the repetitive darkness that keeps coming into your life again and again and again, all the great teachers tell you this is a dream and not in the sense of a, it's, we were just saying that. It's literally, you are in a dream. You are nothingness that has temporarily become somethingness, which will return to nothingness, which will return to somethingness again for infinity and infinity and infinity. And your great attachment to all the minutia of your life that's causing you all this suffering is called clinging. You're clinging to a thorn bush. <laughs> you are, there, it's like there is a love tornado, a tornado of bliss and joy that at any time can suck you into what is called nirvana. But rather than get sucked <laughs> into that, you're holding on to like a barbed wire fence that is cutting into your hands and <laughs> you have confused the agony and pain and of that with uh, yourself. You think your pain is yourself. You think if you let go of that fence and you're no longer experiencing the constant aching, darkness that has followed you through all your days, you will no longer be anything at all 
and the result will be hell at hell. When in fact, according to the teachers, all theoretical, uh, from my perspective, though I have had little glimpses of what that might be, little minute glimpses, uh, uh, the, the ensuing state that happens the moment you really release yourself from the attachment to your identity and after you surrender to being the gum on the foot of nothingness is apparently a kind of infinite bliss, mm -hmm. which then will allow you to enjoy your life it's not as though you get that state and suddenly like now you're no longer working it on it or now you no longer have a family or now you go wandering into the woods. It's just that now when you sit down with your kid or your wife or your friends, you actually are listening to them and you're actually yeah. there for them and you're because you really are yourself and you're not in pain anymore. Mm -hmm. So now you're giving, you're really giving. You become fit them. for service for yourself and the others. Yeah. Again. You know, it takes away all of those. I remember I had a really powerful experience on the Wachuma where I realized that until you shed all of your fear, until you reach that state of fearlessness, which is why the jaguar is the sacred emblem to them, because in that South America, the jaguar is fearless. It has no known predators. It hides in the canopy of the trees. It's nocturnal. It's faster, stronger, has sharper yeah. claws, has no fear. So until you reach that state of fearlessness, you don't have free will and attachment cool. and ego and That's everything cool. else that we that we think is part of it is really just some kind of fear. It's fear of not being important. It's fear of not having substance. Yeah. So until you reach that point of fearlessness, you don't have free will You're getting pushed and pulled. So the transformation into the Jaguar is the gift of free will. It's the gift of being able to lay back and say, you know, I can decide what I want. So cool. And in that moment of free will, which is also a moment of incredibly powerful presence, that's when you can create whatever you really dream. <clears throat> Whether you're an athlete and want to create an outcome in your sport or your game or you're in business and you want to build this attraction or friendships or relationship, that presence is like the gravity of the sun. And when you're burning with that presence, everything attracts to you in this easy way. But when you're caught in the push and pull and the frantic, as you describe, stamping out the fires all over your body, yeah. people are like, whoa, get yeah. the fuck away from that guy. He's on fire, yeah. you know? And that's exactly the opposite of what attracts. That repels. That actually will push you towards your fear almost to show you, hey, you were afraid of this? Hey, what about now? What about now? You're still afraid of it? Here it is. How about now? You know what? You're okay, yeah. right? That's that, why we welcome the fear, Aubrey, <laughs> right? right? Yeah, that's it. That's why we welcome the fear because the because the the for me I am a frightened person and uh, but I recognize that and especially lately since I've been uh, somehow by some miracle managing to like regularly meditate, which is something I'm generally not very good at. In the now when it comes, or as a, I'm someone who regularly eats marijuana too, and when the fear comes. In that form, now at least I try to welcome it because you're like, okay, 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 here it is, here it is. Here is coming into my field of awareness. Here is the great demon. Yeah. And now I get to, now instead of playing the game I've been playing with it, it's like having an abusive dad who comes home and you want to go up into your bedroom so you don't have to yeah, deal yeah, with yeah. him. Like, not you know what I mean like or it's like like being in a shitty relationship where when your girlfriend's car pulls in and your heart drops because you know you're gonna get in a fight or it's like in the same way when the car of fear pulls into the driveway of your awareness generally you have all these reactions or these conditioned mechanisms to ignore it turn away from it so when that car of fear when you hear the fucking bloop bloop of the alarm is uh -huh. whoever's driving that car turns it off uh that's when you're like fuck i'm gonna go play starcraft 2 i'm gonna have a beer i'm gonna that's when you start doing all these att attempts to move away from facing it but if you just do what jack cornfield recommends which is invited in oh you're home come in let's talk yeah that's when the chain starts change starts happening because that fear this is what I'm starting to figure out about it. The thing that you think is the demon is in fact a bodyguard that has run amok. And that thing was there for you when you were a kid and all the shitty stuff was going on and you couldn't protect yourself. So that thing formed around you to keep whatever was hurting you away from you to keep you safe. And it didn't know what to do and it didn't 
know how to do the do it in a graceful way because you're just a kid you can't instruct it Mm -hmm. so like some kind of like beautiful wonderful bodyguard or a dog you know like you hear about the somebody gets shot by a cop and the dog defends its body in the same way like a dog this thing has been trying to fight off the threats in your life it's just that noble honorable and kind and when you realize that this thing that is formerly seemed to be the ruination of your life is in fact a bodyguard that deserves a gold medal and you start treating it that way that's when you bow to it and say oh i just want to say thank you Mm. when i was a kid and i was like in a weird tumultuous childhood with parents that weren't getting along and alcoholism and all the things many of us went through you were there for me to keep me safe and your tactics were necessary and man thank you thank you thank you if you visualize that fear as you're thanking it but honoring it bowing to it it'll swell up with this kind of like pride because it's finally getting recognized for what it is which is your one of your great allies and then that's when the that's when it starts that's when the change that's starts when it happening. starts to change yeah i realized that it was you can never beat it by resisting it, no by way. fighting it. And I had some just kind of this disparate aspects of my mind that were really troublesome. And I was able to, through all the medicine work, start to visualize them. And I would try and push them away and use all these tactics like, that's not me that gets, get out of here. And then one day I had the realization, actually when I was getting some body work done from my friend Parangi, who's a wizard, he gives these like massages with sound and it's awesome. And I ate some marijuana, so I was like extra cool. tuned in. And I felt that presence again. And it's this annoying kind of judging presence. And instead of trying to push it away that time, I said, all right, come back in. Come back in, friend. You know, like I know exactly like you're saying. And I welcomed it. I was like, that's a part of me. Everything here is a part of me. And it's all welcome here. And that since that time, since I changed tactics of resisting that part that I didn't like, that part that troubled me and worried me and I was afraid of, and welcome that back in and say, that's the part of mankind. That's part of our morphic resonance, as mm. Rupert Sheldrake would say, of man, that these crazy thoughts, these fears, that's inside all of us. It's not separate from us. That is us. That is mankind. We have to accept that. But what we choose to act on forms us. And uh, you know, just because you have these thoughts and these fears, you, know, you can choose something else. Welcome them in. They're you. They're part of you. But you're, you're actually what you choose to, to be, and that's enough. And that, that little change in tactics has been a huge, huge benefit in my life. Yeah, man, mine too. And, I, you know, it's so exciting because when you start realizing, like, holy, you know, for, with Buddhism, uh, psychedelics, uh, any real bona fide spiritual path, when you start realizing that it's real. Because, mm. like, when I, if you don't, if you haven't really, like, taken the time to, like, play around, to, like, get into the stuff, to dip, put your toe in the water of the stuff, and you kind of see it from the outside in, if you're me, you know, like Buddhism, for example, I, for years and years, it's just like, eh, they're fooling themselves. I don't know exactly what it is, but I bet they're fooling themselves. Like, there's no way you're going to be permanently happy in this incarnation. So you just forget the fact that, like, think of the greatest thing you ever did. Like, build on it, for example. Like, build a, a sure. beautiful company like this. Think about how much you really believed in yourself to do that or how much you really, like, to build this thing or allow it to come through you. There was, like, a real connection with something, right? Mm. So whenever you look in pictures of a Buddha, a statue of the Buddha that's the size of a fucking eight-story building, <laughs> imagine somebody building that while they thought that Buddhism was bullshit. Yeah. Imagine someone taking the time <laughs> to sculpt that fucking thing and the whole time being like, I'm fooling myself here. <laughs> this is a bunch of crap. Yeah. No, the reason they're building those symbols all over the planet for people to see is because they plugged into what's called the Dharma. They realized that, oh my God, this shit actually uh, is showing me what I really am and that my underlying. Uh, underneath all the neurosis and and, and uh, fear is this beautiful nectar-like state of uh, balance and connection. And 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 the more that I go into this place, the more compelled I am 
to try to help other people get to that place in the same way that if you were walking through a city where everybody was on fire, then you would more than likely try to get a fire hose and a fire truck and it'd probably be a, you'd feel really good if you could putting, putting all those fires out in no even doubt. a small way. And it's contagious too, because one of the coolest visions I had was I was imagining this process of waking up and waking up is really a point of stillness. It's mm -hmm. instead of patting that fire out constantly and running around frantically, you form stillness and then you have free will, you have presence, you can go make these changes happen to other people. And I envisioned all of these people kind of running around like a wind up toy that got awry, you know, it was a little off balance, like tick, 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 and then I was able to step out. I was doing the same thing and I've been doing that and I still get caught doing that Me every too. once in a while. The wind up will go and I'm like, yeah. I'm like, oh, whoa, what the fuck? You know, because I'll feel that happening. I'll get sad or I'll get, you know, emotional about something. You know, these weird things will happen. I'm like, whoa, the wind up is back on, you know. But when you take that wind up off and then I imagined myself free of that and I saw all these people with all these wind up things. Oh, I'm going to take this pill and I take this caffeine on and you yeah. have this sleeping pill and, burp, burp. and I was able to just put my hand on them and say, hey, shh, hey. And they would look slowly over to me and go, oh. Yeah. And then they would wake up for a second and then they could go touch somebody else yeah. and go, oh. And so all of these little crazy chaotic wind-up toys all of a sudden just kind of dropped into a stillness and the network kept spreading and it spread all around the world, this great global awakening of That's everybody it. just going, oh. That's it. You just described it. <laughs> That's it. That's well, it. your description right there is a dream that a lot of people are experiencing. And it, it, here's where it gets really weird. <clears throat> it's a thing that was set into motion a very long time ago. The thing you're talking about was set into motion, has been set into motion by many, you know, a lot of awakened people that we know of and we don't know of. Like mm -hmm. there's apparently like a... Um, there's It's so fun. Like this, there, the, a lot of people talk about something i think it's called the sarmoon brotherhood have you ever heard of that no it's really interesting but the idea is that not only are there these vocal advocates for putting out the fire of suffering in the world but there's also these very uh silent advocates right. for it too but who are actively involved in getting this in, in dis disseminating this information into the world now all that foo-foo shit aside one thing's for certain there has never been a time in human history where an individual's actions have such a direct impact on such a large number of people. And the, to, to, look, to get a great demonstration of this in the negative, go to world, follow World Star Fights on Twitter. Where okay, world Star Hip Hop, yeah. World Star Hip Hop Fights, because they show fights. So like, uh, you know, if some, so some kids will be in a schoolyard or there'll be some kind of awful fight and a guy will like just knock a woman out I, I saw a twitter of this like asshole some woman's running there's a crazy fight and he just punches her as hard as he can in the face and he knocks her down someone films that puts it on the internet world star fights upload it uploads this thing that uh, just a few years ago would have just been something like a candle in a cave that went out or more like a fart in a cave like mm. a stinky moment in time that only a few people smelled now the fart is smelled that psychic violent fart somebody lost in the uh wind up dream that you're talking about perpetrating a ridiculous act of pointless violence now that will echo infinitely through the internet for the rest of human existence or as long as the internet exists that has never been the case before right. the entire universe has become an electronic echo chamber where every single thing that you do for better or for worse has the potential for rippling around the entire planet which means that there's never been more of an imperative for a person to put out their own fire and to figure out a way to help others put out their fire because the technology is now enhancing and amplifying the that energetic wave that is coming out of people for better or for worse. So you see how we exist in a kind of powder. We were either we're in a powder keg, and when and the thing can either explode in the way that uh, when the Buddha was being awakened and the Mara, the Lord of Death, was throwing fireballs at him, and he smiled, and they all turned into flower petals and <laughs> fell to the ground. We can all do that. Totally. We can all do that. And using this technology is one of the one way to do it. But it doesn't just have to be like having a podcast where you 
regurgitate things you've read in books about Buddhism if you're me. It's just like in your own personal life, taking some time to sit still and reduce your own fear levels so that you can spread that to the people around you. Just like what you're saying, Aubrey. Absolutely, man. And it's, I think one thing to remind people of is you can get so caught up in how fucked up things are, you can forget how good it still is. You know, like I had a moment, I was down in Florida and I was sitting on the, sitting on the water. I hadn't talked to people for days. I actually hadn't even heard my own voice, (coughs) which was cool because I was in a, in like a little writing retreat. And you see the high rises in the background. It's kind of a beautiful scene. It's the Bay of Miami. But there's a bunch of high rises in the background. And I saw a manatee mother and her calf like Mm. slowly swimming by me. And it was just such a beautiful reminder that we can coexist positively. I mean, these manatees are very sensitive creatures. They rely on the right, you know, biotic flora in the ocean and the algae and these things. And if, if there's too much pollution, they can't exist. And so these things peacefully floating by with the high rises in the background it was just a reminder like we can do it it's okay it's not too fucked up like it's not time to throw in the towel we got plenty of time to save this hurling spaceship as joe rogan would say we have plenty of time plenty of time we just got to start fucking doing it because and it's the most beautiful time to live because we have everything at our disposal right now we can get The entire earth is within our reach, you know, within a few clicks of the mouse and a little intention to hop on a plane or even visit something virtually. We have, we live in the most amazing time. It has its challenges for sure, but it's a fucking awesome time, which is why to go back to the original point, which we never got to the genesis of Duncan Trussell, I kind of imagine like, I I feel like there's some distinction that remains when we you know, cross that cross over to the other side, we retain some form of, of self just because that's the structure with it works. Organisms have cells. The all has these, we're like cells in the organism, the all it's still the organism, but there's still some kind of cell. And I kind of feel like, you know, I personally believe that there's probably multiple different planets that have life that are sentient. And there's a, there's a moment where these souls or spirits or cells of the all or whatever can kind of be up there and be like, man, where should we go next? Yeah. Oh, look at Earth. Earth's right at that fucking turning point. Let's it's go. like, you want to go? Like, should we do it? And maybe we were sitting up there in a similar conversation to this, you know, uh, in the other. And we're just like, man, Earth, we going to do it? We going to do, do it, Duncan? Let's, Let's fucking do it. Do it. Let's fucking do Earth. Yeah. It's like, I'll see you down there. I don't know when, but I'll yeah. see you down there. Yeah, I love that idea. I love the idea of it at a university. I love the idea more like I called you up and was like, did you get it? I got accepted to Earth. (laughs) Me too. Holy shit. We get to go to that lesson. You know, I I like that. I love that idea. I Mm -hmm. love that idea so much because anything that comes into your life when you imagine that you're on a holodeck instead of on a planet and whatever the thing that has come into your life is, is like, all right, let's run testicular cancer program 798 on Duncan so that he can learn he's... uh, Mortal. Let's do that because the dumbass has managed to fool himself into thinking he's not going to die. So let's like, let's like, he's veered so far off the path that he has actually gotten himself into a, a mental state of thinking that he's uh, an immortal, which he is, but not in this fucking holiday. Let's let's zing him back. We'll just t- cut off one of his balls. He's going to learn that he's not immortal, and maybe that's going to make him a little bit l- less of a selfish asshole. And it sure fucking worked. And when these things like pop up like that, you're like, oh, okay, it's a class, it's a class, it's a class. Here it is again, the test, it's an exam. I didn't know an exam was coming. Pop quiz, bitch. Pop quiz, okay, okay, I can do this one. I can do this one. Uh And every single, and for me, the pop quiz is, testicular cancer is an easier pop quiz to pass than somebody, than, than, than like my neighbor, chastising me for keeping my laundry in the machine too long (laughs) it's those little shitty pop quizzes Uh where you have that one moment where someone's confronting you for something that you think you're right about and you have that one moment to decide that you're gonna pick being loving over being right right Ooh, oh man try to pass that fucking <laughs> test instead of being like no bitch you're fucking you every time i come into this fucking thing it's filled with your goddamn urine soaked dog <laughs> carpets or your the boat you can't fucking monitor the laundry room if i got my shit in there too long when you're using this thing apparently to wash all the clothes in los angeles <laughs> that's the shitty cunty side right, that wants right, to say right. that. but if instead you go 
I'm really sorry about keeping my clothes in there too right. long. You know what? I'll try to do better next time. Uh-huh. Woo! Oh, man. Be kind. Try, play around with being kind over being right. It doesn't mean be a fool. But a lot of the times, winning sometimes, like imagine arm wrestling. Imagine if you're somebody who, who thought, who when you get in an arm wrestling match with your little brother, if you felt the imperative to Smash win every him. time. Yeah. You're yeah, you're a psycho. Let him win. Yeah. Let him win because right. you love him. Right. You have nothing to lose. I have nothing to lose in the world from submitting to somebody who wants to control a tiny little bit of square footage in this dimension that has some laundry washing machines in it. Nothing to lose. Yeah. Everything to gain from a chance to do that one little pull up where you're like, Oh, okay, yeah, no problem. Yeah, it's like confronting like the greatest fighter in the world. Like, I'll kick your ass, man. And he just goes, yeah, okay, probably would. You know, knowing he's the greatest fighter in the world. That's exactly. the guy you admire. Exactly. You know, like, yeah, you probably would, buddy. You look pretty tough. You probably would. Yeah. <laughs> just knowing he's a fucking dragon <laughs> yeah. inside. and just yeah. You can just breathe fire and fucking immolate him on the spot. It's like when, a, when I'm walking my dog, yeah. there's a, from time to time, Somebody has this giant fucking dog that they walk. Giant dog. Some kind of, maybe it's a mastiff or something. I don't know what it is, but it's a big fucking thing. And I have a little chihuahua, a little traumatized rescue chihuahua. Uh And so whenever the mastiff is coming, I have to walk around because, not because the mastiff thing is aggressive at all, but because my chihuahua is like, you motherfucker. (laughs) This thing could like, definitely. I would say, like, in, if not swallow my dog, <laughs> like, just eat the whole thing. It can, yeah. like, in a couple of seconds, break Crush it in half. Yeah. But the dog looks at my little dog with a kind of combination. What appears to be, I don't know if dogs are capable of, like, um, being amused in a kind way. But it kind of wants to play. Yeah. A little disappointed that it maybe, like, it can't be friends with my crazy dog. But it just walks on. No uh-huh. barking, nothing, no violence, no aggression. Yeah. The Mastiff thing is the hero in that situation. Mm -hmm. And my dog in that situation is a wind-up. So it's like, yeah, becoming more like that that dog. Let that dog be your guru. Become that thing so that when all the little barking aspects of this dimension come at you, you just do that sweet, kind, non-condescending look of, man, I wish we could play. Yeah. <laughs> Amen, my cosmic brother. Well, we got a fucking exciting go. live podcast. We yeah. got a float to do. Yeah. We got all kinds of shit. All, things, all kinds of things to do today. Thanks for stopping by, my, my pleasure, brother. man. Thank you we'll so much. Again. What a blast. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Love you guys. We'll talk soon. Peace.